Welcome to the Apologetics Guy Show. It's the podcast that helps you find clear answers to tough questions about God, Jesus, and the Bible, and then helps you to be able to better explain your faith with both courage and compassion. Now, if we're just meeting, I'm Dr. Mikel Del Rosario, Associate Professor of Bible and Theology at the Moody Bible Institute, and I want to welcome you to my new independent show. Tell you a personal story. You know, one Easter, I had a relative tell me about her view of Jesus, uh, this idea that Jesus never claimed to be divine in any real sense, and uh, that there's just no good reason to trust Bible stories about Jesus' death, his burial, his resurrection, things like the empty tomb. So why then, she says, should we consider the idea that Jesus even rose from the dead to be a fact of history? I was in college at the time, and actually I had no idea what to say. And how would you begin to engage in a conversation like that? Because that is actually what we're talking about today on the Apologetics Guy show, explaining how Jesus claimed to be divine and why there are good reasons to believe that the empty tomb is a true story, that Jesus really did rise from the dead. Now, I'm doing a solo episode today, first time I've done a solo episode here on the Apologetics Guys show, but I'm going to be sharing with you some key moments from conversations that I've had with three scholars, three scholars who have joined me on the Table Podcast, which I used to host on the Dallas Seminary uh, podcast. It's a cultural engagement podcast that we do every week. And my first guest is my mentor, Dr. Daryl Bach, who's the executive director of cultural engagement and senior research professor of New Testament at Dallas Seminary. My second guest is Justin Bass. Justin's a fellow alum from the doctoral program at DTS, and he's the author of a book called The Bedrock of Christianity, The Unalterable Facts of Jesus' Death and Resurrection. Third guest that you're going to hear from is Dr. Gary Habermas. He's a distinguished professor of philosophy and theology at Liberty University, and he really actually got me into studying uh, historical Jesus through the resurrection, and that's how I got real interested in historical Jesus studies, and then eventually came to study under Daryl Bach at Dallas Theological Seminary and do my PhD in historical Jesus. The first part of our conversation that I want to dive into is uh, answering the question, how can we talk to people about what Jesus taught if they don't see the Bible as an authority? This clip that I want to share with you encapsulates the approach that I often take with people who are interested in history, but maybe they aren't so comfortable starting with the Bible. And talking about Jesus as a historical figure, I found actually is a great way in to talk to people who are interested in history, but uh, might not be so sure about the Bible. Daryl and I sat down with Justin Bass right after his debate with the famous atheist New Testament scholar, Bart Ehrman. Because before we talk to people about the divine claims of Jesus, we need to ask, what does it look like to get people thinking about Jesus as a real historical figure in ancient history? How do skeptical scholars who don't hold that the Bible is actually the Word of God and that they can trust everything that's written in there, how do they um, try to figure out what Jesus said? actually said about himself if they can't trust the sources just by looking at them? Well, most uh, historical Jesus study is rooted in in the principle that we actually use in our journalism today, which is corroboration. Is there some way we can corroborate or get additional sort or multiple witnesses attesting to the fact that this took place? So in the, it used to be in journalism, this isn't true anymore, but it used to be that newspapers didn't print a story unless they had two fairly independent witnesses testifying to the fact that something happened. Then they felt more confident about it. And after Actually, one of the criteria, they're what are called criterion of authenticity. One of the criteria, uh, one of the criterion rather, is what's called multiple attestation. The more source levels you have testifying to something, a theme or saying or something like that, the more likely it goes back to Jesus on the premise that the more widely spread this is across the tradition, the more likely it is to have roots. Right. And so, um, so that's one. There are other criterion that are also used in dealing with this, but, but it's basically a principle of corroboration that they're looking for. And so when you make these kinds of arguments, and, and sometimes you're 
you have to be aware of these kinds of discussions with certain people because if you come along and say, well, it's just revelation, it's so, they'll go, so I don't believe in revelation and I don't believe it's so. So mm-hmm. what, what reasons do you have for believing that? You've got to think through how, how it would be other ways to say this. So you're always <coughs> often in historical Jesus discussion in a high skeptical mode. When Justin's debating Bart Ehrman, he's in a high skeptical <laughs> mode mm-hmm. and, and, and you're wrestling with those kinds yeah. of questions. So there are ways to talk about this with your, your skeptical neighbors, coworkers, your, your skeptical relatives who don't hold that the Bible is the Word of God. But you can say, look, here are different ways that we can figure out what happened in the past. And they can come to the conclusion that Jesus did claim to be God, um, not just by taking it on faith, quote unquote, right. but that they could actually look at the historical evidence and be confronted with the claim And it would be Jesus. a kind of rationale you'd use with anybody in any kind of setting whatsoever. And so, so it's designed to give them pause, mm-hmm. have them think about, oh, well, that's another way to think about this, that kind of thing. And boom, you're into a conversation. And in, in some cases, people will uh, be drawn to this kind of argumentation. Now, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, why do people doubt, and you know, are they really just strictly for intellectual reasons, or is other stuff going on? A lot of time, there can be other stuff going on that that's impacting the way they argue argue rationally. But what you're doing is you're 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 taking away that that support, that buttress that says, well, I object, and I object strictly on rational grounds. You don't have to mm-hmm. talk about what I am personally, mm-hmm. because because I've got these rational objections that you have to deal with first. And and that oftentimes is a good way into these conversations, because uh, unless someone's really into this stuff, in most cases they aren't aware of what these conversations are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. My historical Jesus research has actually gotten me into so many conversations in Ubers, at the Apple Store, buying things, trying to use my educational discount, and then people say, oh, uh, when I was a doctoral student, what are you studying? And I tell them, I'm studying Jesus as a figure in ancient history. And that kind of gets people's attention. It's kind of a different way of hearing people talk about Jesus. And I found that uh, it's been great as a way in to talk to people who are of no faith or who maybe had a Christian background but aren't so sure about the Bible. And so some of the more skeptical people I meet, though, will say that it's tough to trust the Gospels. Why? Because they were written decades and decades later after Jesus died and the story um, has has gotten changed and uh, there's just no way to get back to before the Gospels. But a lot of people are surprised to know that the Gospels actually aren't our earliest sources about Jesus. It's the Apostle Paul who actually records oral traditions that were around way before any of the New Testament books were even written. So listen to how Justin explains how Paul gets us back to the earliest data about Jesus and how we can actually use that in conversations with people to get them thinking about the claims that Jesus made about himself and what the early church thought about Jesus. You know, we think about the the kinds of uh, people who study what the historical Jesus said. Many of them talk about the Apostle Paul. And can you explain to us why that is and how how Paul can actually help us get back to some of the things that Jesus said about himself? Yeah, a lot of people, you know, think that the Gospels are our earliest sources for Jesus. But it's fascinating that Paul, in his early letters, 1 Corinthians, Romans, Galatians, these early letters were written within about 20 to 25 years of Jesus' death. And in those letters, Paul actually quotes creeds and poems and hymns and other sayings of Jesus that go back to within even a de- the first decade after Jesus' death, and sometimes even as early scholars say, as, as five years after Jesus' death, which is really incredible. So we can go back through Paul's letters, we can get back all the way to the first decade of Jesus' death. Hmm. So back <coughs> then you can say we have people for sure saying Jesus was God. They were worshiping Jesus as God. Yeah, so some, some of these traditions will say things like, like one of the classic ones is 1 Corinthians, uh, quoted in 1 Corinthians 15, where it says that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again on the third day and appeared to all these people. That doesn't specifically say he's God, but we have other creedal traditions that Paul quotes, like 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Philippians 2, and I'll quote the, the one from 1 Corinthians 8, 6, Paul says, and it seems to be quoted from, from early on, that for us there is one God, the Father, through whom all things, or for whom all things uh, came into being and, and for whom all things exist, and there is one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came into being and through whom, and, and through whom all things exist. And that's an incredible statement because it's a redefining of the Shema of Deuteronomy 6, and Paul is basically making the Lord of Deuteronomy 6, Jesus, and God is God the Father. And so he kind of cuts it in half and makes it where 
there are two, he doesn't say what, we, we use persons, persons came later, but there are two, but there's still just one God, and there's Jesus somehow included in the one God of Israel. And so it's an, an incredible creedal tradition that goes back probably within the first five to ten years after Jesus' death. Hmm. So the argument that, that you're making then is if we have people this early on who were, who were believing Jesus was God, certainly that didn't just come out of nowhere. They didn't just make that up out of nothing. Right. They, they got it from somewhere. Yeah, where, 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 do you get, where do you get a crucified man being hailed as God? I mean, this, this is what and – I, and I use this uh, line of argumentation because Bart Ehrman actually in his books makes the argument, this exact argument, that – Jesus, the historical Jesus, claimed to be the Messiah. He believes Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. And he argues that because the earliest followers of Jesus proclaimed him as the Messiah. And he says, look, they were saying that he was the Messiah and that he died and rose again from the dead. And no one in Second Temple Judaism taught that. No one ever said that. And so I'm saying, hey, look, let's look at the in, – in, in our topic. The earliest followers of Jesus said he was God. Mm -hmm. Where were they saying in Second Temple Judaism that the Messiah would be God? Hmm. So I'm saying it's the same argument. Mm -hmm. Why don't you go with that? He, he largely just dismissed it and said, oh, well, that, that doesn't say what Jesus said. But that, that's the same argumentation he used for how he gets to the fact that the historical Jesus claimed to be the Messiah. Because in the Gospels, Jesus doesn't claim to be the Messiah. He accepts it. He accepts people who say he's the Messiah. But you never have Jesus say, I am the Christ in the Gospels. So that, that's exactly mm -hmm. how Irma gets mm -hmm. that argument, and so that's how I'm trying to, to demonstrate that that's how he claimed to be God. Okay. Well, certainly he had to have said something. And Where did this come from? That's, that's right. The, the, the written traditions go back to five to ten years, but the actual experience of Paul literally lands on top of the events in Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. If you think through what it took for Paul to be converted when Jesus appeared to him on the Damascus Road, well, within 18 months. Mm. Of uh, by the chronology of the events tied to Jesus in Jerusalem. He had to have known the Christian message. Mm -hmm. He had to be able to respond to it. When Jesus appears to him, he has to understand what that means. He immediately gets it. That actually dates his theology that allows for his conversion to before his experience with Jesus mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because he's hearing what the church is preaching as a preparation for that. So now this gap that people like to talk about between the event and what's written in the Bible keeps shrinking mm -hmm. and to the point where it's literally on top of itself. And so the issue becomes where there's smoke, there must be fire. In other mm -hmm. words, the idea that, that, that we've got these um, teachings among the very earliest Christians that are going in this direction. Where did they get it from? Mm -hmm. Well, it's unlikely they made it up on their own because it got them into trouble. I mean, why would you make up something that would get you into trouble? That doesn't make sense. There's no precedent for going here, so you, you aren't you aren't forced to go in this direction. They, if Jesus had really taught that he was a great religious leader or even that he was just the Messiah, there was no reason to make him divine. Mm -hmm. Just leave him where he is. Okay, so Paul gives us some very early traditions about Jesus. But you know, people have told me, look, Jesus never said, hi, I'm God. And so when people ask, did Jesus ever claim to be divine, and they start looking in the Bible, maybe we show them places in the book of John, for example, where Jesus says, I and the Father are one in John 10, 30, uh, they're going to say there's no way that that goes back to the historical Jesus. Why? Because we don't see those quotes earlier in the other Gospels, in Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But you see, that's not the only way that Jesus could claim to be divine. But what we get in the Gospels is Jesus choosing to show who he is rather than proclaim who he is oftentimes. And that's what we see in the Synoptic Gospels. So he does the stuff that God does, mm -hmm. and that's how we see it. These are what are called the implicit claims, things like forgiving sin, like saying he's Lord of the Sabbath, controlling the creation. There are a variety of things that are at work here, uh, taking control of the temple, changing Passover liturgy into, into uh, completely different set of references that refer to his life and death. That's a prescribed piece of liturgy coming out of the Pentateuch, coming out of the first five books of the Old Testament, coming out of the law. Who has the right to do that? And so you add all these things mm -hmm. together, that's what you get. Perhaps the most outstanding text that shows this is a passage where John the Baptist sends his emissaries and asks Jesus, you know, are you the one to come or should we expect another? And I say, you know, John the Baptist didn't watch enough television. He should have asked this question a different way. Are you the one to come or should we expect another? Yes or no? Because by leaving the answer open-ended, he let Jesus roam and that's what he did. So he goes back and he says, tell John what you see and hear. And he goes through this list, you know, lepers are cleansed, the blind are healed, the gospel is preached to the poor. And most of those phrases come 
come out of sections of Isaiah that talk about what's going to happen when God does his final deliverance. So he's saying, I am the Messiah, but the way you know it is by what I'm doing. He doesn't talk about it because for Jesus, words are cheap. A lot of people can make claims. The real proof is in the pudding of real life experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And if and I you're good. If I can just add to that, um, that's actually also a text. The story of uh, I like to call it doubting John the Baptist. You mm -hmm. know, we hear about doubting Thomas, but mm -hmm. here's John, John the Baptist actually doubting. Bart Ehrman actually accepts this text as historical, as going back to Jesus. And it's really uh, incredible to learn the way Jesus probably did talk about himself, because here he is directly asked by John the Baptist mm -hmm. himself, are you the one to come or should we expect someone else? And he doesn't come out and just say who he is, and he doesn't start calling him God or I'm the Son of God or I'm the Messiah. He does it in a very implicit way. And I think this is the way Jesus did talk about himself until probably that last week of um, – before his death, and that's where he makes the most explicit claim, which I know we're going to talk about later, but his claim to be the Son of Man at it, God's it, right hand. It certainly is the way the synoptics lay it out, this very uh, implicit kind of indirect way. In fact, it bothers a lot of believers when they read the, God, the synoptic gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, to have Jesus do it so indirectly. And then when we come to the Gospel of John, there's a lot more direct stuff going on mm -hmm. here and there, very privately, by the way, in most yeah. cases. Or there's implicit stuff, I and the Father are one. Okay, which the theologians who have a good theological antenna get. Mm -hmm. You know, they get what the implication is of this kind of that's thing. Right. So that's the way this works. So an attempt to say that John is really radically different from the synoptics, which is one of the arguments Ehrman made at the debate, actually doesn't work as well as Ehrman tries to portray it as if we've got an early Christology here that's something less than divine in the synoptics, and we've got this exaggerated Christology in John that's doing something later and that's really from the early church. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this explains why he was rejected by the Jewish establishment. Establishment because of these kinds of claims, is that right? Exactly. That's what got them. That's what got him in. That's what got Jesus into trouble. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and if I could, you, one of the ways I I tried to demonstrate too that the way Jesus talks in John is uh, even testified to in the Synoptics is what they call this meteorite fallen from Johannan sky. It's mm -hmm. this great phrase, and it's a Q saying. It's found in Matthew 11 and Luke 10. I'll just read it real, real quickly. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Sounds a lot like the way Jesus talks in John. He refers to himself as the Son in the third person three times. An incredible saying, and, and only he knows the Father. When I challenged Bart with this, he just said, well, I don't believe it went back to Jesus. I said, on what basis? And he really didn't give a response mm -hmm. to that. Now, for those people who don't know what Q is, could you quickly explain what that is? Yeah, Q is just the, it just means uh, source in German, and it basically is the sayings of Jesus that are found in Matthew and Luke, not found in Mark. So, so it seems that Matthew and Luke, who probably did not have each other when they were writing, they probably wrote independently of each other, they had Mark, they, each of them had Mark, but they also had these other sayings that, that are almost identical in, in the way they say it. And so a lot of people think that goes back to a common source, oral, written, it's debated. But I, but I think it's, it's probably right that they, there's some common tradition, some common source, we can call it Q or whatever, that they, Matthew and Luke, are both uh, drawing upon. And that... And Q, the, this this saying, any any saying found in Q, even critical scholars like Bart Ehrman would say that they, it dates to the early 50s. So now we're getting back to the same time as Paul's early letters when we talk about the Q sayings of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And this is the way he talks in the Q saying. Yeah, there there you're talking about 200 about 200 verses, 200 235 verses, and the way it splits out is is about. Um, about a third of them are almost exact. About another third are very close, and then another third there's debate because there's enough variation between them as to whether they're included or not. That's why you'll get different numbers when people talk about Q. But it basically is the sayings that appear in those two Gospels, not in Mark, on the assumption – this is really the key part of it – that. Luke and Matthew didn't use each other, so where did all this stuff come from? It's about mm -hmm. one fifth of each of these gospels, so you know that's a substantial portion. Where did it come from? The idea is cute, and in historical Jesus discussions, which are always rooted in some form of skepticism about proving whether this stuff mm -hmm. comes from Jesus or not. In historical Jesus discussions, your two major sources inevitably are the stuff that comes out of Mark and the stuff that comes out of Q. Those are your two mm -hmm. major places where you're often landing to look for stuff <coughs> that even the skeptical scholars will acknowledge in many cases will come from Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we see that Jesus was actually a lot more implicit in the Synoptic Gospels in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but he claimed to be divine through a combination of his words 
and his deeds, the things he said, the things he did. And it made people stop and think. There are two events that I really like to talk about to put these things together and show how Jesus claimed to be divine, how he claimed to have divine authority. And these two events are the healing of the paralytic and Jesus' Jewish examination. The first story is a story where Jesus gets called a blasphemer, and it's near the beginning of his ministry. It's the story in Mark 2, 1 to 12. This is the healing of the paralytic. It's a famous story. You might have heard of it. Jesus is teaching in a house, and all of a sudden he's interrupted by some people who start taking the roof off, kind of a thatched roof, and so they start tearing the roof off the house. These guys drop in and they uh, uh, lower one of their friends who is paralyzed on a stretcher in front of Jesus. Jesus, his teaching is interrupted, so he just stops and he looks at the guy and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. And then the scribes who are there, they are talking to themselves, thinking in their hearts, why is this guy speaking like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins except God alone? And these guys actually get it. They understand that Jesus is claiming to do something that only God can do to forgive sins. And then Jesus says, after they think he's a blasphemer, he says, so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. Then he turns to the paralytic. He turns to the paralytic and he says, I tell you, get up and walk. And when he walks, then everybody knows that Jesus actually can forgive sins. And I love how Gerald Bach explains this. Listen to how these implicit claims work in the Gospels. Mark 2 passage is important because what Jesus is doing is he's showing something that you can't see by something that you Mm -hmm. can see. Mm -hmm. So he's got a paralytic in front of him who's asked to be healed. (laughs) When when the paralytic drops in his presence, he doesn't say, I'm going to be healed. He says, your sins are forgiven. Now, I guarantee you when the paralytic first heard that, he was pretty disappointed. You know, that isn't why I dropped into this party, (laughs) you know. Forget about sins. I'm going to walk. Exactly right. And so, but then he turns around and he says, in order that that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. That's something you can't see. Mm -hmm. I say to you, get up and walk. He links it to something you can see and that requires the power of God in order to happen. And so so that's how he links it. So that's, that's actually how the implicit claims work. Jesus is doing something. If he's a sinner, if he's a deceiver, then how are these things happening? Mm-hmm. Okay. But if they require the power of God and he's doing them and he's making claims of authority while he's doing them, mm-hmm. that underlies the implicit claim. Well, the Son of Man is the way he does this. Another one that has the note of authority is the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Okay, Who has authority not just over the divine calendar, but literally one of the distinctives of Judaism. The Sabbath was a unique day in the worship of of the Jewish faith. Mm -hmm. It marked out a Jew as distinct. It was part of the sacred calendar. It was commanded in the Pentateuch. It was seen to be a reflection of the seven days of creation. I mean, the, the roots of this are deep. Mm-hmm. And, as a, and he, I have authority over that. Right. Um, mm-hmm. so, so those that's how an implicit claim works. And the implicit claim with the Son of Man is coming together to really give it this stamp of authority that, mm-hmm. that you're connecting very correctly to the title. Mm-hmm. And, and another thing on the Son of Man forgives sins, we have the resident expert on this, but they say blasphemy there, mm-hmm. which is an important connection between Mark 2 and Mark 14, which mm-hmm. we'll talk about later. But in the climactic statement of Jesus claiming to be the Son of Man before the high priest, they'd also declare blasphemy. So you have that connection between Mark 2, kind of lead, almost like a foreshadowing mm-hmm. of what's going to happen in Mark 14. Yeah, yeah, one of the great ironies of that text is is that you know we tend to give the Pharisees and the leaders in the Gospels a hard time, but every now and then in the movement of the narrative, they actually are giving us major clues for what's going on. They mm-hmm. get what Jesus is they doing in a way it. that many people don't. Now, mm-hmm. they don't believe it, you know, they reject it, yeah. but they get the point get of what what's being said, mm-hmm. and, and the text indicates that so it, you know you know they're they're saying to themselves you know in the te- in the mark 2 text who can forgive sins but God alone and mm-hmm. in the gospels whenever anyone's thinking something privately in front of Jesus it's not good for the person doing the thinking <laughs> the next thing that happens in the passage is there's some type of response or corrective or mm-hmm. explanation
imagination that is dealing with what the person is thinking. And that's exactly where the um, Jesus goes through the example of what's easier to say, your sins are forgiven, or rise up and walk, and then in order that you might know that the Son of Man has authority on us to forgive sins, I say to you, get up and walk. And when he that's gets right. up and walks, his walk talks. Mm -hmm. And what his walk is saying is the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive mm -hmm. sins. That's right. Mm -hmm. And so, and so, and the and the Pharisees have already put the theological stamp on that. That's something only God does. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly a claim by Jesus to be the Son of Man. Right, right. And that was an excellent observation about uh, Mark 2 and 14, because here you have early on, he's using the term Son of Man. He's called a blasphemer, mm -hmm. and then God vindicates his claim by healing this guy. Why That's would right. God vindicate the claim of a, a sinner or a blasphemer? That's right. But then toward the end of his life, we get the Jewish examination, which mm -hmm. I can never get away with calling it a trial in front of you. That's exactly right. Uh, <laughs> so That's you, right. Uh, it's a grand jury yeah, yeah. investigation because the Jewish authorities do not have the authority to put Jesus to death. Mm -hmm. They're actually gathering the evidence that they can take to Pilate, and it has to work. This is what some people don't get about this scene. The worst thing that could have happened would have been for the Jewish leadership to take Jesus to Pilate, for Pilate to examine Jesus and to say, he's not guilty, I'm releasing him. Mm -hmm. Because then he would have been put in the position of, we went before the Roman magistrates and they said we're not doing anything in violation of the law. So they have to get this right. And so this examination is the gathering of Evidence. And the irony of this scene, the great irony of this scene is, is that the person whose testimony is responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus mm -hmm. is Jesus himself. Mm -hmm. He's the one who, who issues the utterance and they say, we've got what we need, we can go to Pilate now. Right. And it's because he responds by saying, in effect, um, uh, when he's asked if you're the Christ, uh, I am and you will see uh, the Son of, of Man riding on the clouds and seated at the right hand of power is the way Mark puts it. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's a, a roundabout way to refer to God out of respect because there's something respectful going on. He's been, he's been put under an oath when the question is asked and so he <laughs> responds in kind being, are you the Son of the Blessed One is the way the question's asked, showing mm -hmm. respect for God by not saying Son of God. And Jesus responds by saying, I'll be seated at the right hand of the power doing the same thing back. So they keep the solemn uh, note of the exchange even as the exchange is going back and forth. But the claim is, you can do whatever you want to me, but one day mm -hmm. I will be your judge and yeah. I will be seated at Things the right hand of the Father. Mm -hmm. And yeah. they Things didn't like switched. that answer. Things will be switched. And the assumption is he's actually predicting He's actually predicting his vindication by God, yeah. because God's going to take him to the right hand. That's an allusion to the resurrection. So when the tomb goes empty, Jesus is saying, you'll be able to contact me at www.righthandofgod.com, <laughs> and, and God will have vindicated me, and he will have cast his vote in this dispute. Mm -hmm. and, and that's important that he just he, he could have just said I am he didn't have to say all the other stuff that's right mm -hmm. he said I am but he didn't have to say and you will see the son of man I mean he added that and that's the most and that just happens to me in the, what people have called the Christological climax of the synoptics I mean it's 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 on par I think with before Abraham was mm -hmm. I am and so in Mark 2 we see that the scribes understood Jesus's claim to possess divine authority to forgive sins and then in Mark 14, the Jewish leadership understood that he was saying that he was the Messiah and that he was going to judge them one day. Jesus was saying, in effect, there's going to be another trial one day, and you guys won't be judging me. And so, hence the offense, right? Uh, this is one way to bring up the claims of Jesus with somebody who is interested in Jesus as a figure in ancient history. And it really is so important to think about the claims of Jesus, the things that he said about himself and who he is, because it's actually the claims of Jesus that fill the resurrection with theological meaning. It's the claims of Jesus that fill the resurrection with theological meaning. Well, so now let's turn to the empty tomb. I want to talk about the empty tomb today because I've heard people tell me there's no good reason to trust the Bible stories about the empty tomb of Jesus. So how can we even consider that Jesus rose from the dead? Let me share three reasons with you right now that you can share with others to talk about the empty tomb. First, there is evidence that supports the idea that Jesus was buried in a tomb. That's number one. Number two, the testimony of women supports the story of the empty tomb. And number three, the location of where the first reports went out also support this as being a true story. So let's start with the first one. Jesus' burial. Jesus' burial supports the empty tomb. 
See, in order for the empty tomb to be real, Jesus has to have been buried, first of all. So how do we know he was buried? We know that Mark's gospel mentions a guy named Joseph of Arimathea. And this is the person who had Jesus buried. This guy was a secret follower of Jesus. He was part of the Sanhedrin. And incidentally, that's the same group that took Jesus to Pilate. But how would you answer a skeptic? Think about this. If somebody said to you, um, it was standard procedure for Rome to just leave these corpses hanging on the cross. Uh, They weren't going to bury Jesus because it was standard procedure to just leave them on the cross or rip them down and throw them in a shallow grave um, and just throw them in a ditch where they'd be eaten by dogs. That's something I've heard people say a lot. I love how Daryl answered this question when I asked him this question. What would he say? And I think it's something we can very easily take into our conversations. Check this out. So when John Crossan says something like um, Jesus or the corpses may have been left on the cross and Ehrman comes out and says it was standard procedure to leave him on the cross, are, are they just mistaken there? Well, no, it's standard procedure to leave it on the cross. And what the text is telling you is, is that there was a special request in the case okay. of Jesus, which Pilate honored. So I can have that be standard procedure. Mm. Standard procedure means that happens in most of the cases, gotcha. but it doesn't mean it happens in all the cases. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I love that. It's a surprisingly simple answer, and yet it's totally true. That doesn't have to be every case, even if it was standard procedure to let the bodies uh, stay on the cross. Well, if the gospel authors wanted to make up a story about someone arranging for Jesus to be buried, think about this. Why would they say that it was a guy who was linked to the very group that wanted Jesus dead? Why would they say that? Why would they make that up? Why bother even giving a name to this guy, Joseph of Arimathea, when people in Jerusalem actually knew the members of the Sanhedrin? They knew their names, unless that's how it actually happened. And that's the only reason we have this in the Bible, is because the tradition is being very careful to report the actual person who is responsible for putting Jesus in his tomb. All right, next let's talk about the women who discovered the empty tomb. This is a great, great little snippet I want you to hear. Let's think about the importance of women being the first witnesses to the resurrection in God's sovereignty. These were people who, whose voices were marginalized in their culture. So check this out. Um, early, early in the morning, some women woke up early to go to see Jesus in the tomb where he had been buried. But what they didn't know is that Jesus got up earlier than them. <laughs> <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm going to ask you, Daryl, what is the significance of these first witnesses showing up at the tomb? Well, the um, real significance is, is that in the ancient world, normally speaking, a woman wouldn't count as a witness. So the flip side of this is if this story were being made up and created, which is what some people claim, the public relations meeting for keeping hope alive because we've got a dead Messiah who's still dead. The crucified. Well, about dead crucified. That's yeah. right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. He's yeah. not getting up from – if he goes through a crucifixion, he's not getting up from the dead. You know, what, how do we do this? Well, and, and now we're going to make up a story to try and keep this hope alive. It would never have mm-hmm. begun with women being the first witnesses to this event, mm-hmm. that you would take a culturally questionable category, physical resurrection, tie it to witnesses – who don't have cultural credibility in order to make your case that the culture should believe this happened. Hmm. That would never be put together. as a ma- So the reason the women are in the story is because they're in the story. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, 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 that's the only credible explanation for why they're being there. Women could only testify in very limited circumstances in the ancient world in certain kinds of cases. That's it. Otherwise, their testimony didn't count for anything. So this is a countercultural move that that interestingly enough, it's so countercultural that it shows that this story is not made up, that mm-hmm. there's something going on here that caused the disciples to absolutely change their mood from being despondent and in despair to now having all kinds of joy and a re- realization that something really significant had gone on. And of course, that significance is the vindication mm-hmm. of who Jesus is. We often at Easter preach the idea that uh, that you know he's alive and one day we'll be alive. But the real message mm-hmm. of Easter at its core is God vindicated Jesus and showed him to be yeah. who he was so that everything else that we talk about on Easter actually does matter. Mm-hmm. Okay, so now let's turn to Jerusalem. Now, Jerusalem would be the worst place to try and pull off a hoax about Jesus rising from the dead. Listen to how Gary Habermas explains the importance of Jerusalem, the place where the resurrection reports first went out. 
if you're going to preach bodily resurrection, which was a radical idea in the ancient world, if you're going to preach bodily resurrection and there's somebody in that grave, do it in Rome, do it in Ephesus, do it in Egypt, Mm -hmm. but don't do it in Jerusalem. Jerusalem's the last place you can preach that story if the tomb is occupied. And it's it would be so easy to, to disprove it. If you found any body in the tomb, Christians lose. They didn't say Jesus is in the tomb. They said nobody is in the tomb. They said mm-hmm. the tomb is empty. If you find a body in the tomb, you lose. The, they could only preach that message if there was no body or no body in the tomb. <laughs> right. And that's how it went. And so it was only on the presupposition. Anybody can take a stroll and find out if there's a body there or not. If nobody else is, is there, uh, you can you can look in. You can check it out. And they couldn't do it. So if you're going to preach bodily resurrection, that tomb better be open. Whether you can identify the corpse or not, it's irrelevant. There ought to be no corpse inside that tomb. If your co- proclamation is not just that Jesus isn't there, but that nobody is there the fact that there are believers who come out of this situation in the midst of this preaching in Jerusalem in the very place where it happened means there's got to be an empty tomb the fact that there's a story circulating that says the body was stolen mm-hmm. tells you there is an empty tomb that you're dealing with mm-hmm. that that people are having trouble uh, coping with as the preaching is going on so much so that there are a variety of suggestions as to why that tomb was actually empty but still, there are scholars who reject the idea of the empty tomb. Only about 75% of scholars today uh, will grant that the empty tomb is a fact of history. Now, that's up from about 20% only of scholars way back in the 70s. So it is a, uh, still the overwhelming majority of critical scholars. But why would somebody reject this idea that the empty tomb is a true story? Real quick, Gary, when you found the 75% of scholars that held to the empty tomb, is that 25% all worldview issues? What, what was the, the issue with those who didn't, did they just think the evidence wasn't good enough, or, or what? Uh, you know what, we, we think a lot of times when someone disagrees with us, and they're big name scholars, we assume that it has to be evidence. They don't see good evidence. Now, now they critics do say that once in a while. They'll say, how come there's no empty tomb recorded in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following? There's a dispute about whether an empty tomb is implied, given a Jewish understanding. And by the way, both John Dominic Crossan and Marcus Borg both say that, that the empty tomb could very well be presupposed in that creed, although Dom goes on and says he thinks it was a Markan construct. But we think they're doing things for reasons of facts. And very, very, very frequently, it's because of emotions. And critics don't like to tell the other side that they're right. So I think largely it's non-factual issues that are keeping people from agreeing. But even so, mm-hmm. 75 is way up from when I was in grad school. So wow. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased for the change. You know, as we approach this topic at Easter time, it's important to remember a couple things. First, that as Christians, we don't just believe things historically. We believe things theologically as well. There are theological implications to these events in history. And there are very practical ramifications for our lives as Christians, if in fact Jesus really did rise from the dead. And these are everyday differences that we can actually see in our daily lives. For example, the way we mourn, the way we go through grief, the way we go through suffering. There's a tangible difference there. We don't mourn or grieve like those who don't have hope. And Gary told me a story about how the resurrection impacted his life in a profound way, in a very personal way, as he was going through a very difficult time. Listen to the story. And Gary, could you tell us uh, the story that that you tell about how the resurrection has really um, impacted your life when you were going through a a very difficult time um, with your your wife? Um, Tell that story to us. My wife, it, it was over pretty quickly, but my wife had been sick for a few months. We had no idea what it was. And when they finally sent us for testing, they'd already sent us for other tests, but when they sent us for the final testing that discovered it, it turned out she had stage four stomach cancer and she died uh, four months later. Uh, that's all, all she lived. But 
before she got sick, I had done some publishing on the subject of doubt. And in one of those publications, I was reflecting on Job and Job's talking with God and Job 38. And I made this make-believe scenario what my Job 38 would be if I got to ask Job my questions. What would it look like? And I had published that. And three years later, she got sick. And so I thought, oh, my, for crying out loud, I can't believe this. Now I have to see, does the advice I give in this earlier document really work when I'm going through the fire? And so we got back from the hospital um, where they told us there's nothing they could do for her, and she was terminal. And the kids were in school. It was the first week in May of 1995. She was upstairs sleeping because she was given a medicine for stomach cancer that made her sleep 17, 18 hours a day. And I put a child monitor up there and went out and sat on the front porch. It was starting to get warm. And I had my Job 38. And I I literally sat there and thought, wow, this is my day in the sun. I can can think like Job 38. And I had this make-believe conversation. Only now, It was the same one I had three years earlier with the resurrection, but now it was spiced in a way by my wife's obvious dying, and she didn't live too much longer. But as I sat there on the porch, imagining what God would say to me, I would start by saying, Lord, why why is Debbie upstairs dying? I mean, she's 43 years old, and she's the mother of our four children, and I thought you called me to ministry, but how can I minister, and how can I teach, and how can I publish if my kids need breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and they need their clothes washed? We had four children, and if they have to have their homework done at night, how can I get anything done? And so I said, why her? Why now? Why this? And she's my best friend. And in my Job 38, the way I saw that is that the Lord would have said to me, you know, Gary, I appreciate this. I, I, I appreciate your laying this out, but I've got a question for you. What kind of a world is this? Now, notice that's how Job 38 start, starts, too. Where were you when I created the foundation of the world? And I pictured the version for me would be, what kind of a world is this? And I didn't know what to say, and she's dying, and I didn't want to play theology. And so I said, well, Lord, I don't know. I'll, talk, I'll tell you in, in terms of my own studies. It's a world where your son came to earth, died for our sins, was raised from the dead, and we can have a lot to hope for because of this. And, and he said to me, in my imagination, the Lord said, well, it's a good start. That's a good place to start. Uh, and, you know, I know what you're going through. Well, I'd read a lot of literature and later wrote a book on grief, and, and I knew that's the last thing you say to somebody who's dying. I know what you're going through. Even if you did go through what they went through, the problem is they could look at you and say, yeah, but you're over it. I'm not. I'm in the middle of it. So don't talk to me about this. Well, I picture God saying to me, I know what you're going through. And I thought, all right, how so? And he said, well, I watched my son die. And I said, I'd already been told it was terminal, but I hope there was a way out for her. And so I was shocked when he said that. And I said, wait a minute. Are you telling me that as you watched your son die, I'm going to have to watch Debbie die? And I pictured him saying to me, son, you're going to go through some deep water. But someday you will be, as the last card I put away after she passed away, the last card said, how are you going to feel someday when you're talking about the yellow brick road finally issuing into the Emerald City? The card said, how are you going to feel walking down the streets of heaven hand in hand with your wife? And I'm telling you guys, when I read that card, I thought I was going to die. When I opened that card up, I, I couldn't repeat those words for a year. Mm-hmm. You'll be able to walk down the streets of heaven hand in hand with your wife. And I and so I picture God saying to me in the words of the, that card, I pictured him saying, Gary, you got some deep waters to go through, but one day you and Debbie will be in the kingdom together with us. And it'll be a glorious time, but I can't explain it all right now, but just keep that truth ever before you. 
And basically, that was a shortened version of the conversation. Later, I told the story again. That was the, the, the three-year earlier story that I published with her death put into it. And so I interpreted her death as my sending my greatest gift home to heaven. And it would have been the other way around if it had been me that died. But I sent my greatest gift home where she couldn't be touched. In the words of 1 Peter 1, 3 and following there, nobody can take this away from me. Nobody can, she can't be hurt anymore. Nobody can steal this. It's garrisoned in the halls of heaven. Yes, it's horrible, but yes, she's safe. And yes, it's forever. And yes, it's about reunion. And metaphorically, because that you know, conversation never took place but with the Lord. But metaphorically, yeah, that's what the resurrection meant to me. So it's symbolized. It's not great right now, but this is, you know, as philosophers have said th down through the ages, this is not the best of all possible worlds, mm -hmm. but it's the best way to achieve the best of all possible mm -hmm. worlds. And I knew I was going to have to get on with the achieving part. Mm. Yeah. Well, well, thank you for sharing that with us, Gary. You're welcome. What a great personal story that shows how the resurrection of Jesus makes a real difference in how we go through tough times, how we grieve differently from people who don't have the hope that we have in Jesus. But here's what I want you to take away from these key conversational moments that I shared with you on today's show. First, that talking about Jesus as a figure in ancient history can be a great way to begin, to begin conversations with people who don't see the Bible as an authority. Uh, number two, the church didn't make up this idea of Jesus being God. Jesus claimed to be divine. Jesus claimed to have divine authority, and we can see that in the earliest Gospels, including the Gospel of Mark. He has authority on earth to forgive sins. He has authority in heaven to judge sins. And authority in heaven and on earth means divine authority over all of reality. That's just amazing. When you put together the things Jesus said and the things that Jesus did, authority in heaven, authority on earth, you see the claims of Jesus are way beyond what anyone, prophets, priests, any other miracle workers, even in the Greco-Roman world. Jesus is totally unique compared to his contemporaries. And number three, finally, there are good reasons to believe that Jesus' tomb was found empty. All of this should not only raise the question of Jesus' resurrection, it should raise the question of the truth of the Christian faith. What this evidence is, is actually an invitation for us to consider the claims of Jesus, to consider the historicity of the resurrection. Because if the resurrection is true, then Jesus is who he claimed to be. And if Jesus is who he claimed to be, then Christianity is true. And that means that eternal life is possible and it's available to you and the ones that you love. I love how Gary shared that personal story of having the hope of eternal life, a hope that isn't based on some fairy tale somewhere. We have a living hope, and our hope has a name. His name is Jesus. I want to thank you so much for joining us here on the Apologetic Skies show today. If you like the show, please do leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. It really helps new podcasts like this one. And do check out our previous episodes, including a full conversation on the resurrection with Dr. Justin Bass. It's episode number eight, and it's called, Did Jesus Rise from the Dead? Facts that skeptics miss and few Christians know. You're going to love that episode. If you'd like to support the show, please consider leaving us a super thanks on YouTube. I hope you'll join us again next month for our hashtag First Friday Habit here on the Apologetics Guy Show. I'm your Apologetics Guy, Mikkel, and until next time, keep the faith. <laughs>